The following broadcast is released under a Creative Commons license. I believe in Jesus Christ, the only Son of God. I believe He lived and died, and that He rose again. I believe and trust in Him. Ascended into hell, Christ our living head will one day come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe and trust in Him. I will trust in my Redeemer, seeing of His love. The last forever Know His hope And sure salvation I will trust in Him Oh, the world falls around me I rest and know That He has found me Christ, the rock, is my Welcome all to Pastor Yeshua. You've been listening to Creed by Richard Jensen from his album Order of Service. By way of introduction, Pastor is an acrostic which stands for Preaching All Salvation Through One Redeemer. Our Redeemer, Yeshua, Jesus, is the Hebrew name for the Lord. It means Yahweh, the Lord, is salvation. Translated from Hebrew into the Greek language, the name Yeshua becomes Jesus. The English spelling for Jesus is Jesus. This program deals with apologetics, questions on and about God, the Bible, and the Christian faith. I take questions and seek by scripture to give answers and encouragement for everyone, including the tough-minded living in today's skeptical society. And now, let's join Pastor Yeshua. Welcome to Pastor Yeshua. As was stated in an earlier episode, when we study all of Scripture, we tend to see that indeed God seems to create all things according to a pattern which testifies of Him. As we continue to look and study the visible and invisible things of creation, we are able to increasingly see God's reflection to some degree in that mirror. When these examples occur within Scripture, we characteristically refer to them as types or shadows. We shall also see that ultimately, as with all scripture, that these types and shadows point to the substance, which is Jesus. In this episode, we continue our study of types and shadows with none other than the classic episode of Noah's Ark. This incident, set after only eight generations from creation, remains the greatest report of disaster on record. Lest we write off this tragedy as an ancient record from the past, Let us recall that Scripture remembers this event and warns us today of a parallel judgment yet to come. Let's pray. Father, I pray that your Spirit would prepare our hearts and minds to hear and receive what your Word says to us. I pray that like Noah, we each would have courage by faith to separate ourselves from the world which is in rebellion and be reconciled to you. I pray that your word mixed with faith would give us the confidence to prepare ourselves for your imminent return, as well as to be messengers of your gospel to the world around us. In Jesus' name, amen. As stated, it only took eight generations from Adam, the first man, until Noah, the eighth man, for the world to degenerate to the point God was grieved he had created man on earth. Less than 1,000 years earlier, Adam and Eve enjoyed face-to-face fellowship with God in the garden as his image-bearers, clothed with God's glory in a world which God had proclaimed as, quote, very good, unquote. Within this relatively short period of time, Scripture records the following in Genesis chapter 6, verse 5, quote, The wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually, unquote. 
Now, it must be said that since the fall, the scriptural definition of sin, i.e. falling short of God's glory, has been present with all men save Jesus. But here, in this instance, chapter 6, verse 5, records a condition which a casual reading may not readily do justice. A more literal study of this verse could be paraphrased as follows. Quote, and God saw that men had become continuously malignant and evil like animals. Every purpose, imagination, and meditation of man's innermost being was nothing but evil at all times. Unquote. Later verses record the earth as being corrupt, which translates as being ruined or perverted morally. This situation begins the unfolding of events, which is one of the richest and most beautiful types of God's plan for salvation. The type is simple. Now as then, on the majority of the earth, man's every thought and deed is that of depravity and rebellion. Then, as now, we have an elect few chosen of God who find, as Noah did, grace in the eyes of God. God has appointed a date and a time, known only to him, when he will pour out his divine wrath, just as he did in Genesis, against all those who are in rebellion. Mankind has the warning and the choice to either continue his sinful rebellion or choose God's gift of grace, as Noah did. Then as now, there is but one way to escape God's coming flood of wrath. God gives us, as he did Noah, the commandment and warning to enter into the ark. The question is, how do we enter? As this episode about the ark airs, there is coincidentally a movie just in release regarding the same subject matter. In researching the reviews for the movie, I noted an interesting quote from the movie's director who stated that when he first read the story of the ark, he was scared because he didn't know if he was quote-unquote good enough to get on the boat. Perhaps there are others who feel likewise even today, but he and others who assume this train of thinking miss the point entirely. Entry onto the ark was not predicated on being quote-unquote good. If it had been, then according to Romans chapter 3, verse 23, no one would have entrance, because all have sinned and fallen short, and there is none that doeth good, no, not one. The good news is that then, as now, we enter as we are, by grace, through faith in Jesus Christ, and have his righteousness, i.e. goodness, imputed to us, as did Noah, by trusting God. This is the moral of the story. The ark is the type of Christ, and only those who enter into this ark, which is a relationship held by faith, are saved. Those who choose or refuse to enter will ultimately be destroyed by his wrath to come. Noah did not conceive or plan the way of salvation. How could he? Noah had never seen a flood, and the scope of the devastation and destruction which was to come may have been inconceivable. Though Noah had never seen rain, he labored day after day with his family, building the ark, preaching repentance while the world scoffed. Just as it was Noah's commission, it is our commission as Christ's followers to preach, teach, and demonstrate God's grace by word and by deed. Our very presence on earth should serve to be salt and light to a world headed soon to death and destruction. Christ's righteousness stands as a beacon shining through his saints by his indwelling Holy Spirit to encourage fellow believers while condemning those in unbelief. At the outset of the story, God tells Noah to build rooms within the ark. The ark and its many rooms within are a reminder of John chapter 14, verses 2 and 3, which says, quote, In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also." Unquote. It is interesting to note that the word rooms translates as nest and is used as such in many other verses. This concept is reminiscent of the protective relationship of a fledgling bird in its nest to its parent. Here are a few of those verses which serve to remind us of God's love and protection. Deuteronomy chapter 32, verses 9 through 11, quote, For the Lord's portion is his people. Jacob is the lot of his inheritance. He found him in a desert land and in the waste howling wilderness. He led him about, he instructed him, he kept him as the apple of his eye. 
As an eagle stirreth up her nest, fluttereth over her young, spreadeth abroad her wings, taketh them, beareth them on her wings. Unquote. Psalm chapter 17, verse 8. Quote, Keep me as the apple of the eye, hide me under the shadow of thy wings. Unquote. Psalm chapter 36, verse 7. Quote, How excellent is thy loving kindness, O God! Therefore the children of men put their trust under the shadow of thy wings. Unquote. Psalm chapter 57, verse 1. Quote, Be merciful unto me, O God. Be merciful unto me, for my soul trusteth in thee. Yea, in the shadow of thy wings will I make my refuge, until these calamities be overpassed. Unquote. Psalm chapter 61, verse 4. Quote, I will abide in thy tabernacle forever. I will trust in the covert of thy wings. Salah. Unquote. Psalm chapter 63, verse 7. Quote, because thou hast been my help, therefore in the shadow of thy wings will I rejoice. Unquote. Psalm chapter 91, verse 4. Quote, he shall cover thee with his feathers, and under his wings shalt thou trust. His truth shall be thy shield and buckler. Unquote. Luke chapter 12, verse 24. Quote, Consider the ravens, for they neither sow nor reap, which neither have storehouse nor barn, and God feedeth them. How much more are ye better than the fowls? Unquote. And finally, Luke chapter 13, verse 34. Quote, o Jerusalem, Jerusalem, which killeth the prophets, and stoneth them that are sent unto thee, how often would I have gathered thy children together as a hen doth gather her brood under her wings, and ye would not. Unquote. Now, as we look at our story, we learn that no matter what the circumstances are, whether that of a worldwide flood, the day-to-day -day trials, troubles, and refining fires of life on earth, or the ultimate judgment of wrath of God on an unbelieving earth by fire, God is reminding all to come and abide by faith in Christ, i.e. a better ark, wherein is the divine promise of immovable safety, provision and love until we reach our heavenly home. Returning to our story, as the next of God's instructions come, Noah is told to pitch the ark within and without with pitch. It should be noted that the name Noah means rest. So quite literally, the message is that we, like Noah, are to rest in Christ. Second, perhaps most profound of all, is the word pitch. The word pitch is translated from the same Hebrew word translated elsewhere as the mercy seat or covering. The mercy seat, of course, is the same item designed and built as the lid or covering for the Ark of the Covenant found in the Holy of Holies. As a reminder, the Ark of the Covenant contained the tablets of stone on which was written the law, i.e. God's Ten Commandments, the pot of manna, and Aaron's rod that budded. It was upon the mercy seat that the high priest would sprinkle the blood of animals once a year on the Day of Atonement for the sins of the people. Thus, the mercy seat, like the ark with its pitch, stands as a barrier or covering between a holy God and sinful man. Whether we consider the ark of Noah or the ark of the covenant, we see the type of Christ our Lord. Those who are called, as Noah was, are placed by faith inside the ark. Inside the ark, the believer rests, as Noah did, covered by grace, just as the ark was covered by pitch, the type of foreshadowing grace. Once inside the ark, the occupants of the ark, i.e. believers, are separated by the ark and the pitch, i.e. grace, from the water, i.e. God's wrath, poured out on sin. Next, notice the order in which the ark is to be pitched. First, the ark is to be pitched within, then without. Like the pitch, faith and the resulting grace which flows from Christ's righteousness and shed blood springs forth within the heart of the believer through the indwelling work of the Holy Spirit. As the work of the Holy Spirit continues within the believer, they are transformed by the renewing of their minds and are conformed into the image of our Lord from faith to faith by the process of sanctification. While the Spirit of our Lord Jesus Christ dwells within us, His Spirit, power, and grace are made manifest without for all to see. 
The fruit which others see is not by our power, nor by our righteousness. It is there by his grace and an indwelling power, just as the pitch, i.e. grace, was placed on both the inward and outward side of the ark by Noah's faith. So the process begins on the inside with grace, i.e. pitch, and ends outwardly by grace for all to see by faith alone, by grace alone, by Christ alone. As we look at the ark, God's design for the ark is instructive. Genesis chapter 6, verse 15 and 16 illuminate further. Quote, and this is the fashion which thou shalt make of it. The length of the ark shall be 300 cubits, the breadth of it 50 cubits, and the height of it 30 cubits. A window shalt thou make in the ark, and a cubit shalt thou finish it above, and the door of the ark shalt thou set in the side thereof, with the lower, second, and third story shalt thou make it." Unquote. First of all, the length of the ark is designed to be 300 cubits long. The number 300 is associated with complete deliverance as is found in Judges chapter 7, verse 7. Quote, and the Lord said unto Gideon, By the 300 men that lapped will I save you, and deliver the Midianites into thy hand, and let all the other people go every man into his place. Unquote. Second, the number 50 represents the number of jubilee, or deliverance, as is described in detail in Leviticus chapter 25, verses 8 through 10. Quote, and thou shalt number seven Sabbaths of years unto thee, seven times seven years, and the space of the seven Sabbaths of years shalt thou be unto thee forty and nine years. Then shalt thou cause the trumpet of the jubilee to sound on the tenth day of the seventh month. In the day of atonement shalt thou make the trumpet sound throughout all your land. And ye shall hollow the fiftieth year, and proclaim liberty throughout all the land unto all the inhabitants thereof. It shall be a jubilee unto you, and ye shall return every man unto his possession, and ye shall return every man unto his family." Unquote. Additionally, the number 50 points to Pentecost, to the pouring out of the Holy Spirit upon the church. Pentecost begins with the Feast of First Fruits, which occurs during the barley harvest season on the day after the Sabbath. The Feast of First Fruits is initiated with the Wave Sheaf Offering Day, found in Leviticus chapter 23, verses 9 through 11, and then culminates 50 days later with Pentecost. In this type, the wave sheaf offering is the type of the substance, Jesus, who offers himself as the gift for the full harvest which is yet to come. Fifty days later, Pentecost has come at which time the Holy Spirit is poured out and the full harvest of God's church has begun. Pentecost falls on the eighth day of the seventh week and is the first day of the eighth week. The number eight, i.e. the number of souls in the ark, is associated with new beginnings, new birth, and is the type of all those souls who are delivered through salvation of Jesus Christ, who is the ark. Thirdly, the number 30 denotes perfection, redemption, and divine order. According to Numbers chapter 4, verse 3, a priest could not enter into service in the tabernacle of the congregation until he was 30 years old. Jesus himself did not begin his ministry until he was 30 years old. Next, the ark was constructed with one window, which was one cubit above. Therefore, all light received inside the ark comes from above. All light, all truth,